Welcome everybody to the ep another episode of Queer is Here to Stay. Um, my name is Ronnie, my pronouns are they and them. And joining to me today is Rachel Wu, who is an LGBT program facilitator uh, in Manitoba. Thanks for having me, Ronnie. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Uh, did you want to tell a, um, a little bit more about what you do? Because you yeah. don't really know. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I'm a 2ST LGBTQ plus program facilitator. So my role is pretty broad. Um, and basically, I'm willing to take this information wherever I'm asked to bring it. So that ranges anywhere from middle school, starting in grades five and six, all the way up through grade 12. So I see uh, middle school students and high school students. I also spend time uh, with folks in the education system. So both guidance counselors and teachers during professional developments. I help service providers to navigate these sorts of things all the way across the board, uh, from the medical and legal system to social services, uh, to the universities and colleges. Again, just kind of wherever folks are willing to um, let me talk about these topics. And then uh, we do offer a few additional things. So we offer things like outreach. So we're always happy to table at events and bring this information uh, to like youth wellness days or career symposiums or anything like that. We also offer things like counseling and support groups out of our office um, and really just kind of work to educate, um, like I said, anybody who's willing to listen about these sorts of topics. Because you guys are part of the Sexual Education Resource Center in Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't heard about you guys for like a while when I was like going through my entire journey. And then I joined a volunteer peer wellness group at my university. And we had um, you guys' uh, training uh, guy come in for a little bit. It was very informative, but I, I'm still learning. So like, yeah, so I learned what cisgender meant. <laughs> yeah. Things are like the language and terminology is just always changing. And especially I think right now, because the conversations, they're almost sped up so much faster because we went from like not talking about these things and having, you know, any education around these things to now it's, you know, everywhere. And I often find that you know, youth in grades five, six, seven, and eight tend to know more about these topics than a lot of the service providers and adults that I talk to, just because there's such a huge, like, generational divide in, like, how we talk about these topics. Yeah, like, I come from a pretty small town, like, less than 8,000 people, and our sexual education was abstinence is key, you know, very religious, um, and like I had questions for myself and I didn't know the information. Mm -hmm. Like I once asked my mom if I was a boy and she went, no, you're a girl. So it's like, that turns out to spirit. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's really what we try to do is just, you know, obviously we're not here to tell anybody, you know, what's best for them or anything like that. What we really just try to do in all of our education is just lay out all the facts for everybody um, and just create and hopefully, you know, create those spaces where people do feel comfortable to choose, you know, whatever works for them. But the more informed people are, the better they can make choices for themselves. My journey involved thinking I was bisexual and then thinking I was lesbian then asexual but now two-spirit but asexual as well so it's like trying to find those words and I only found the words after I went into a very deep depression and went to counseling mm -hmm. so, and it didn't fix everything because like I still had to come out but I found the right words and it was like very relieving Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even just that, like, you know, at the same time where for some people, you know, being labeled isn't their thing, which is awesome. And for some people, it's just about finding that one term that resonates for them. You know, there's a lot of terms around there floating around. So sometimes it can be hard to figure out what one works for you. And sometimes people have to try some terms on before they figure out what works for them. But almost every single person I've talked to, you know, once they find that term that works for them, it's just like a huge relief and just like a weight off their shoulders because they're like, oh, this finally describes everything that I've been feeling for this long. And they can finally now put, you know, a label on it for themselves. Yeah, because like labeling is like both a good and a bad thing. I find like it's good to finally know who you are. But at the same time, you don't want people like stereotyping you as well. Mm -hmm. So it's like part of that. But I wanted to ask you about the acronym like it started out as like 
LGB, I think. And then it evolved into a lot. And I was wondering if you could talk about that. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So I think the acronym is a really interesting point because I feel like For folks within the community, you know, that's not something that we necessarily focus on as much. You know, we know that folks who are in the community are in the community, but I often find, because I do do a lot of work with folks who aren't connected to the community, I find that a lot of them, the second they see that long acronym, they kind of get panicky and they get nervous. And it's also, you know, a different order than they might be used to as well. So even just from that initial view, um, they're kind of nervous already and kind of panicking and, and worried and stuff like that. But I think, you know, one of the biggest things that I tell people is, you know, if you look at the history of the community, there never really has been an exact term that everybody uses that works for every single person kind of thing. So, you know, what I really say to people is, you know, having some of that language and terminology in your brain or in your ears is good as like a foundation. But at the end of the day, you know, every single person has a different way of looking at how a term works for them Mm -hmm. and might have a different way of describing it kind of beyond what we sit call those like dictionary definitions. So I always say to people, you know, Um, These are kind of the definitions that we look at, but being flexible um, and being willing to listen to somebody's experiences and somebody's way of viewing that kind of terminology for themselves is a really great way to show, you know, respect and relationship building with somebody. Because like you said, you know, even about the stereotyping, it's not making that assumption that, you know, oh, this definition that I read is the exact same definition for every single person who identifies with this term. Because we know that that can look so different from person to person. You know, those things are influenced by culture and where somebody is and, you know, where they are in the world. And there's so many different factors that play into that. So I always say to people, you know, don't be too hung up on the order of the acronym or anything like that. Different groups and organizations and people just choose to use different ways of laying out that acronym for lots of different reasons. So specifically at CERC, we use the acronym 2STLGBQ+. So the reason that we use the acronym in that specific way is just to recognize a couple history pieces. So first, we moved the two S to the front of our acronym to recognize, you know, Indigenous histories and that Indigenous people have always had connection to conversations around identity um, and relationships and community and connection. So we know that those things have always been here. And then we've also moved the T to the front of our acronym. Um, and I'm sure we could do a whole episode on, on pride as well, too. But, uh, you know, we move the T to the front of our acronym to recognize, you know, um, you know, what's often viewed as the catalyst for the LGBT movement. So the Stonewall riots, um, which are said to have been started by trans women of color. So that's why we've also moved the T to the front of our acronym. Uh, I always say to people, though, when I first started at Cirque, they used a different version of the acronym and then they changed it about two months into me working there. So it's not one of those things where, you know, we're seen as the experts in the community. So we got it all figured out or anything like that. Like any part of language, these things are always changing and adapting. Um, So I always say to people, you know, if you mix up the order or you say like LGBTQT plus, you know, whatever, people know what you're trying to say and people get it. Nobody's going to get mad at people if they're using like a different acronym or a different order or anything like that. I think it's just really recognizing that the community is so diverse and being open to that and having that flexibility with folks that you meet and not just kind of being so stringent um, and so set in definitions. Because I think that's really what the community is kind of moving towards is not necessarily being stuck in boxes like we've been for so many years, but instead kind of recognizing that people can exist beyond that. Um, You know, these are some of the terms or textbook terms that we look at, but there's so much nuance for like every single person. So that's kind of like what I would think anyway about the acronym. Yeah, like for me, like the acronym is full of a lot of umbrella terms. It can cover a lot, maybe everything and maybe nothing. You know, it's part of why I've named uh, the podcast Queers Here to Stay because queer is a very umbrella term, but it was Mm -hmm. also used as an insult for gay people like way back when I'm not quite sure when and Mm. we're reclaiming that word so it's also part of a reclamation I guess Mm -hmm. Um, for me like two-spirit is also a huge umbrella term because one it's a westernized word but it differs from like 
indigenous culture to indigenous culture across North America. So it could mean something else entirely from where I am. And I have mm-hmm. my own definition. For me, yeah. it's like I have two spirits that come together within myself. And that's how I identify myself. And then there's like also with me and my uh, asexual part, like there's so many different kinds. Like um, I was known as a sex repulsed asexual, as in doesn't interest me. But then there are people who are asexual but are willing to have sex with people they love and different things like that. So it's like so many umbrella terms. And I'm never sure if it's a good or a bad thing, but I still use Mm -hmm. them. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like I saw this good post the other day and it just kind of made me think about all of this. And I feel like it encapsulates things pretty good, but it was just like um, you don't have to understand all of the nuances of gender identity to understand that somebody knows themselves better than we ever could. So that's really kind of what I look at it. You know, I think having an idea of some of these terms, you know, having heard them before, I think is really helpful. Um, But at the end of the day, yeah, there is so much, you know, nuance from person to person about like what a term can look like for them. And there's so many different things that can influence that, that I think is just about, you know, allow people to exist in whatever capacity works best for them. And then, you know, as we build relationships and connect with other people, we just allow them to kind of fill in those gaps for us as they feel comfortable. And it's just about creating that environment where people do feel safe and comfortable to share those things with us. Um, You know, whether or not I always say to people in workshops, you know, it's not like you're walking around with like a notebook or dictionary full of all these definitions or anything like that, but it's about providing that like respect and that caring um, for people to be able to share, you know, what those terms mean for them and what that looks like for them. Yeah. Cause like to me, Labels are important, but that's not the case for everybody. Mm -hmm. People are different. And that's sort of like part of what the community tries to celebrate is everyone's uniqueness. Exactly. That's wonderful. And um, today I wanted to talk about uh, mental health, uh, mostly within the queer community, but I know it exists outside. But I want to see how it affects those within the LGBT community. And I was wondering uh, what uh, your training covered with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think one of the biggest things to note, and like you said, you know, mental health can affect anybody, you know, regardless of the community that they're from. But of course, you know, folks within the LGBT community do face, you know, some things that are specific. So often what we look at when we talk about the LGBT community and we talk about mental health, we look at something called the minority stress model. And what the minority stress model often looks at is the ways that external and internal manifestations of things like prejudice, victimization, and social stigma can actually create real health differences for people. And that's where we often see mental health outcomes um, being affected for LGBT people. So in a previous episode, we discussed, you know, coming out and we talked about what that can look like for folks. And when it comes to things like um, coming out as LGBT or having some of these conversations, it's more often than not, not that person struggling with their identity or um, who they are and their thoughts and feelings, but oftentimes it's the external um, outcomes of that, you know, what other people think of that, how other people treat them based on their identity. So oftentimes a lot of these mental health health aspects aren't coming connected to somebody's LGBT identity, but what the external um, forces and internal, you know, thoughts and feelings they might have about sharing that information. That's really what we often look at. So, you know, we often still see youth um, being kicked out of their homes for being LGBT. So, of course, that's going to have mental health outcomes. You know, it's illegal, but we still see people, you know, losing jobs, losing housing, friends and family for coming out as LGBT So, of course, these things are always going to increase people's, you know, um, risk of mental health illness or likelihood that somebody might go through a crisis or any of those sorts of things. So it's oftentimes the environment surrounding somebody um, that creates mental health outcomes for them. Yeah, it's definitely been part of my experience. Like, first, like internalizing it all, like it just put more and more weight on my mental health. And I, mm-hmm. you know, had more depressive episodes. Um, and coming out was like, as I said in a previous episode, very mixed. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
it took me a long time to be comfortable with myself, but it's just like, I lost friends. I had a best friend since I was in kindergarten. Uh, we were bullied and teased in middle school called the lesbo couple, you know, very rude children. And she had also started dating boys at that point because, you know, why not start dating at 11? And she just stopped talking to me one day and that was it. Uh, but I wasn't even out by that point, right? Mm-hmm. It was just enough to be associated with it. Um, but I also gained friends. Mm-hmm. Like um, a person I'd known in high school, I talked about him previously. He became my ally. We knew of each other in high school, but weren't really interacting. But when I was going through a bad time in university, he came forward and helped me out and talked to me and listened. And it was a good sounding board. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, and I think that's sometimes the biggest thing that people can do for folks within the LGBT community when it comes to things like mental health, because, you know, especially when we're often combating things like stereotypes and social stigma, where it's not necessarily, you know, the thoughts and feelings we have, but we're exposed to these things through media, through, you know, conversations that other folks are having. So I think even just having those people who you can connect to, you know, a lot of what you know, connection is for LGBT people, a lot of it is that chosen family. So people who aren't necessarily our blood, um, but those who support us, love us, respect us exactly for who we are. And, you know, somebody doesn't have all the, have to have all the answers or know all of the language and terminology to be that support, especially when it comes to mental health. Um, And that can go for anybody, you know, outside of the community as well. Just being that listening ear for somebody who's dealing with mental health um, can be a great um, tool and a great way to show, you know, your allyship and your connection to that person. Yeah, like I gave some allies and like when I first started university, I wasn't out. I didn't know myself and that affected my mental health a great deal. But um, I also started becoming really good friends with someone I had known in elementary school. She was a great younger than me. She started university. Um, we wound up being roommates. And this is when I was still dating the male gender. Right. And she's very traditional. I think is the right word. And then I broke up with my boyfriend and came out and I told her these are the terms I like. And she continued using the term homosexual. And it was a word I did not like because that's not me. Mm -hmm. So she wound up being quite toxic for me. So Mm -hmm. mm, losing her as a friend was difficult, but at the same time, it was better for me, for my mental Mm -hmm. health. So it's like trying to learn to see who is there for you, you know? Mm -hmm. And sadly, it's not always good. Mm -hmm. And I was also wondering, uh, within your program... Uh, What kind of resources are people able to access in terms of their mental health? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few things that we do. So we actually offer mental health workshopping as well. So if there's ever um, a time when like a group or a classroom or, um, you know, wherever is wanting to have a conversation about mental health, we're always happy to do that. There's places like um, mental health as well within part of our public health system. So that's always a great one as well, too. And then specifically, you know, for folks who identify as LGBT, we have a few things. So we have things like counseling, which is done primarily over the phone. We also offer support groups as well. And for some people, you know, these are spaces to just meet other people within the community and to connect. Um, and get that kind of social aspect amongst their peers and people who understand their identity and are respectful of it. Um, And then in some instances, we also use these spaces, yeah, to, you know, if folks are experiencing certain things or, you know, wanting to talk about issues that they've been having, we also use those spaces for those sorts of things as well. And then Part of the work that I also do is making sure that folks are getting the supports that they're needing. So referring them um, to inclusive counselors that we know or mental health practitioners or um, general physicians or anything like that. We're willing to do some of that like work for folks um, to make sure that they're getting any of the resources that they're needing wherever they are, because we know that so many people within our province Um, are in very rural communities and it's not always as easy for folks to travel into the cities uh, to get support and resources. So there's also a few different online ones that I would suggest. So folks like um, the Trans Lifeline, which is a really great one ran by trans people for other trans people. And then groups like the Trevor Project, which are specifically trained in LGBT identities and support. Um, You know, there's lots of great call lines out there, but sometimes it can make a huge difference to talk to somebody who understands 
understands your identity um, and you're not having to educate them while also getting that support. Mm -hmm. It's like growing up, I had no idea. Like I started seeing counselor from quite a young age because Mm -hmm. like kid of divorced parents and all that. My counselor, when I told him I liked girls and boys at that point, because, you know, I didn't know myself. He's like, and it was just like, so I've had very mixed uh, experiences with the mental health uh, community. Mm -hmm. Um, Some were like, no, you just, you know, need to figure yourself out. You know, Mm -hmm. you're not, you know, that. Then I found a counselor at my university and I saw her for like four or five years and she's been fantastic and Mm -hmm. completely 100% accepting, even though she didn't always understand what I was saying. You know, terminology always changes, of course, but she was great. So, yeah, because having somebody who you don't have to explain and educate to as you're also trying to get support for yourself is such a huge difference and can really, you know, make or break those relationships. And it's not to say that, you know, folks can't learn those things, but there's also a time and a place. And when you're trying to look for support, you don't want to also be having to do the educating as well, too. So, yeah, we're always happy to make sure that folks can find um, practitioners that are exactly what they're looking for, because we don't want to put people or risk people being um, traumatized even more or, you know, engaging with further risk to try to find things like healthcare providers, because we know that that's difficult on a good day, um, let alone trying to make sure that you get somebody who can understand you um, wherever you're coming from. My sister, she had moved to the same city as me for a little bit, um, which is where she met her future husband, which is fantastic. But um, she had found a doctor. She really liked this doctor and the doctor was great for her. Um, I had to go to walk in one day, you know, just wasn't feeling good. So I went to her doctor uh, with her and I told this doctor, I'm two spirit. And she's like, do you need an exorcism? It's like, no. Oh, so goodness. Like, good doctor for my sister, not so much for me. So I never mm. went there again. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So it was an interesting experience to say the least. No doubt. So like she's entitled to her opinion, but that's a bit much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> What kind of stories um, have you heard without, like, naming names, of course? Like, what has coming out been like and what has it meant? Mm, That's such a good question. And I feel like the coming out process looks and has looked especially different over these last couple years dealing with COVID as well, too. So I would say that um, especially over these last two years, we've seen an influx of people coming out or, you know, sharing who they are with folks because we've had so much additional time for introspection, we haven't been as social as we once were, you know, our connections um, for young people, you know, in schools and at GSAs is so different now. So we've seen a lot of young people um, coming out. So I think that those conversations, because they're so normalized at that age group, we've seen a lot of younger people coming out But in the same hand, we've also seen a lot of older people coming out as well uh, because these conversations are more normalized. It's a lot more safe and comfortable for people who have always had these thoughts and feelings to now come out um, at this time. Whereas for some of them, you know, they might have been alive at a time where being homosexual in Canada was still illegal. So I think we've seen such a shift in generations um, in the past few years, but also, you know, with the um, increased you know, barriers or, you know, things with COVID as well, too. We've seen, you know, even more people coming to these realizations and and coming out. Yeah, because, like, I've noticed that, like, first coming out was, like, very judged. Like, when Ellen DeGeneres came out, Mm -hmm. it was considered chaotic. And I was watching a special on um, what they called the puppy episode, because they said she shouldn't come out, just get her a puppy. So they called it the puppy episode. And they actually got bomb threats. Mm-hmm. And it, they had to like evacuate, and like it was ridiculous. And Alan didn't get work for like ten years. Mm-hmm. But now it's become like more normalized. It's still not like entirely accepted, but people are adjusting better. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Like, when I first came out, I was around twenty-two. I actually came out on my sister's birthday, which was on the twenty-second as well. Um. But I was being a brat, you know, um, saying something rude. I don't even remember what. But I wound up crying in my grandmother's bathroom. And my grandma's trying to get me to come out. And I literally came out. So 
Um, I just told her I'm weird. I'm so weird. And she's like, no, you're not weird. I'm like, I'm embracing the weird. I'm gay. Like, it was the easiest way to explain it at the time. And she's like, okay. And that was it. 100% acceptance. Mm-hmm. And like, it was relieving. But I didn't come out to the rest of the family until later. Like, I think it was like the following Thanksgiving uh, time. I came out to my mother by accident by saying as a gay person this is what i think you know that typical lead-in to voice your opinion and my mom goes what (laughs) it was like so out of the blue for her and she didn't talk to me for two months wow um but then my grandmother her mother phoned her and told her off (laughs) so there's no age where that stops Mm -hmm. um and my mom started talking to me. She wasn't fully comfortable with it. My mom's very, not very religious, but she has an intense faith that I wish I had. Mm. And um, she finally came around while talking to a few people from her church and well, only those she trusted, of course. And she's not out about me being out, which is like odd. But then she like, messaged me randomly one night and said what what are your pride colors and i'm like well this is random why are you asking and she told me she was making me a a traditional indigenous ribbon skirt in my pride colors wow and like it's fun to cry at 10 at night so my mom went from not talking to me about it to being accepting enough to make me something so special Mm -hmm. and that was amazing however Telling my other grandmother, my father's mother, was an entirely different situation. Mm -hmm. Um, She's older. She's ornery. (laughs) And um, we think she had dementia for a couple of years leading up to this. But she wouldn't accept it. She didn't look after herself whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And this happened again on my sister's birthday. So I'm really sorry to my sister. (laughs) Um, But... Me and my sister were, like, making jokes back and forth, being, like, a little bit inappropriate, but just joking around, you know? And it came to the topic of my sexuality, and we were teasing each other about it. How my brother's, like, the token hetero in the family. Yeah. Uh, My sister's pansexual. And then there's me, who's, you know, too spirity sexual, and I, you know, whatever. And my grandmother was like, no, that's ridiculous. You're in university. You're just going through a phase. And I told her, no, I'm not. This is my preferred name. Please call me by that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I shouted it, so that didn't help. But then she shouted back, you're an abomination, and I wish you were never born. Mm-hmm. For her miracle grandchild. Like, my mom wasn't supposed to have kids, you know? So, but, like, it hurt, but at the same time, it was the dementia. Mm-hmm. So, like, plus product, product of her generation. So I didn't talk to her for three years. And then I phoned her right before she had to go into a home. Mm. And she didn't remember it at all. Didn't bring yeah. So it's like three very different coming out experiences for me. And mm-hmm. I'm sure a lot of people have had it either better or worse. But that was my experience. Like, there shouldn't be a need to come out, you know? Mm -hmm. we are who we are and I've completely accepted myself and even though my grandmother had said that and it hurt I didn't change my label just because she wasn't happy with it you know Mm -hmm. I am who I am and that's not going to change and for me it's like why do we need to come out when straight people don't um again it's like from an uh Ellen interview when she um first came out in 97 I think it was she was on the Oprah show and uh, a straight woman was like saying like why do you need to announce to the world like I don't announce that I'm like you know having sex with my husband and she's Ellen just answered with well Time Magazine wants to talk to you and it's just like I don't know Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah and I think like you know when it comes to you know coming out I, I, it's so interesting when I talk to young people and they recognize that like 
yeah, there is just kind of this assumption that we're all straight until we come out. Um, and I always, you know, reference things like Disney movies, and we can see it in so many different types of media that there's this assumption um, until we choose to come out. But, you know, I really hope that we're continuing to kind of move in a direction where, you know, while these conversations are happening at such a younger age and so many young people are so accepting of these things, I hope that we can continue to move towards a direction where, yeah, it isn't a coming out process. You just, you know, are who you are and those things aren't, you know, a conversation. And it's even just interesting to see how, you know, um, heterosexuality is often like so pushed from like such a young age and you know there's conversations around the lgbt community and having conversations at a young age and trying to you know turn turn people lgbt or or anything like that but i think you know the biggest thing is just about leaving room for people to figure it out you know mm -hmm. if all the options aren't on the table then of course people aren't going to know all the options but if you put it all out on the table, it's a lot easier for people to figure out, you know, what works for them and what doesn't work for them, as opposed to, you know, like you said, feeling weird or feeling different or not like your peers or anything like that. But if we lay out all of those options on the table, it's a lot easier for people to, you know, not um, have, you know, those mental health um, struggles and stuff like that that often come with that, which we'll talk about um, in another episode. So folks can join us for that one as well. Um, but you know, there is a lot of mental health outcomes that can really come um, from that coming out process. Like more often than not, most LGBT people have thought about you know, their identity and their terms for a long time before they ever choose to come out to somebody. And then even when they do, you know, there is still often a lot of hesitancies around that, not because that individual doesn't feel solidified or understanding of their own identities, but it's oftentimes, yeah, those external factors that play into, you know, the emotions that we have about our identities or that coming out process. You know, we can't ex be expected to feel fantastic in our identities when we're getting, you know, really negative reactions or, you know, we're mm -hmm. still seeing youth being kicked out of their homes for coming out or, or those sorts of things. So, you know, I really hope that we can move towards a direction where coming out isn't doesn't need to be a process. Um, but at the same time, also recognizing that it is um, such an important and impactful moment for some people as well. Yeah, like coming out for me was like a bit weird because like I literally found the terminology for myself in a university uh, student resource office mm -hmm. like I didn't know about this as growing up even though I kind of like had questions and I think people around me knew like my brother introduced me to Thomas Sanders on YouTube mm -hmm. he's very openly gay and his slogan is could be gayer and like my brother didn't know at that point you did I and like my sister like she was out before I was, and like her attraction is based on personality rather than gender. Although now she's got a husband and a baby, so mm -hmm. I also wanted to talk about like for people who don't have these labels, don't need to come out. How can they be an ally to those who are who trust them? Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question, and I think you know when it comes to allyship, people again kind of get nervous about that sort of terminology. They're like, "Well, I'm not sure what that looks like." I often like to substitute the word ally for just being a good friend or community member or, you know, peer or any of these things and just really kind of looking at it from, you know, how can we make people feel safe and comfortable? And I think one of the things with allyship is about willing to admit that you don't know things and that you don't have all of the answers and providing that listening ear can oftentimes be more helpful than anything. Just providing somebody that space of non-judgment um, and understanding to be able to talk about the things that they're dealing with. Um, but also, you know, when we hear things like jokes or, um, you know, things like that, so gay or no homo or like those sorts of things that we're making sure to combat that sort of language. Because when we normalize or allow for jokes like that to just kind of go by unchecked, oftentimes what that's doing is creating that environment where, you know, jokes are okay and we're fine with that and we let those things go. But those things can begin to compound for people as well. And the more we allow things like jokes um, and, you know, comments and passing and stuff like that to um, permeate and kind of take hold and take root within our spaces, 
those are the things that really create um, really hateful dynamics, create spaces of homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, those sorts of things. So as allies, um, I think one of the biggest things that can be done is to make sure um, that those things are being combated because more often than not, you know, the LGBT staff member um, is probably already feeling uh, nervous or ostracized for their identity within, you know, especially cishet spaces. So as allies for folks in the community, you know, using your space as, you know, a cishet person can be a great way um, to combat those things without putting all of the focus on that, that individual. So I'd say, Biggest things for allies, you know, be willing to know, you know, for lack of a better term, your place in those conversations. So not speaking up over the individual, allowing them to lead those conversations, being okay with not having all of the answers. Um, and also, you know, using your voice to stand up, you know, when jokes and comments are being made, uh, that can, those are big things that can be combated by allies to create more um, inclusive spaces. Yeah, like one of my allies basically became one of my closest friends. We knew each other in high school and we wound up at the same university. Mm -hmm. And he's one of those people who, who's like just, you know, whatever on the case of attraction and gender and sex and everything. Mm -hmm. And he would just listen to me and it was fantastic. And I also came out to my best friend that I'd known since we were in diapers. Mm -hmm. Like we lived across the hall from each other. She's my first girl crush in middle school. And I actually told her, you were what you know, help me figure out that I liked girls. Mm -hmm. And she was actually like, okay with that. And it was just kind of a weird reaction. But then my friend, uh, my other friend told me, well, she loves the D. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, you know, it, it's fantastic to have a good support system. And mm -hmm. it was a long time to get there. But like, it was good to have it. Absolutely. And actually, I came out pretty much every time at my grandmother's. So yeah, very safe place. <laughs> so um, I want uh, to end this episode of coming out of the closet and into a judgmental world and how to deal with it. And thank you to Plank Sip for helping me produce this. And thank you to Rachel Wu for being my guest. Bye, everyone. Bye.